We're going to move on to our first panel of the day on designing for AI. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Ben Schneiderman, Manish Agarwala, Salima Amershi, Genevieve Bell, and Elizabeth Gerber. So Ben is a CS professor and founding director of the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory at the University of Maryland. This is really one of the first significant players in HCI. He's a real founder of the field. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Manish is a computer science professor here at Stanford, also an undergrad and PhD alum. Um, and he's the director of the Brown Institute for Media Innovation at Stanford. Salima is a senior principal research manager at Microsoft Research and the co-chair of the advisory group at Microsoft called Ether, AI Ethics and Effects in Engineering and Research, where she focuses on human AI interaction and collaboration. Genevieve is a professor, director of the School of uh, Cybernetics and director of the 3A Institute, which stands for Autonomy, Agency and Assurance, all at Australian National University, and she's also the acting dean these days, so we really appreciate her making the trip, and a Stanford PhD alum as well. And finally, Elizabeth is a professor of mechanical engineering, CS, and communication studies, as well as co-director of the Center for Human Computer Interaction and Design, all at Northwestern, and also a Stanford PhD alum. So welcome, everyone. Our panelists will each offer up a short presentation before we begin our conversation. And so, Ben, would you like to start? Good morning, good morning. Thank you, James, and thank you, Russ, and the organizers for this great event and the courageous title of AI in the Loop. That really sets things right. That's where we have to be. Uh, and the second part of that is humans in charge. And that's what we want to put humans first. So that's the story. In this panel, I'm going to lead off and try to give some examples of what we mean by good design and then come to conclusion with some guidelines, some of the many that I've developed. I mean, the central question, and James laid it out in his very elegant opening, what is human-centered uh, AI? And he really nicely uh, uh, characterized that we were dealing with users, we were doing, dealing with communities, and we were dealing with society. We have to think about multiple levels. One of the gifts of design is the clarity of thinking of separating out user communities, market segments, and understanding the different communities of users. James also put the point that it's a set of processes by which we go about doing design. And it's a set of guidelines, which is where this section is going. So design brings a fresh way of thinking and breaks open the box of AI, this global large monster that we don't even know how to look at. But now we can see the parts of it. So for me, the central premise is that the goal is to amplify, augment, empower and enhance people. That's why we're building systems. That's what technology's always been about. That's what Lewis Mumford said. We start from serving human needs. I mean, there is a gain to technology-driven innovation, but there's even a bigger gain from user needs-driven innovation. And that's what HCI has brought to this and what human-centered AI is understanding what are the human needs that we can fulfill and how do we go about doing it? Um, this talk focuses on one part of it, which is the way we reframe our thinking. The, the design metaphors, the language we use, the terminology, and the visual imagery. Please take away all those images of a human hand shaking a robot hand. It's <laughs> deadly, OK? That's the wrong, wrong, wrong message. Where do we want to go? We want to talk about human needs. We want to put people first up front, OK? So my list is to shift from some old language. This is going to be hard because the old language is compelling. It brought people into this. It raised funds. It attracted journalists, OK? Intelligent agents, we're going to do it all. Teammates, collaborators, partners as AI. Assured autonomy, not just autonomy, but assured autonomy. And then social robots, we're going to make it all happen. Well, social robots have been around for 2,000 years. They're not coming. They're great entertainment. And the Disney audio animatronics and the other forms of entertainment are what we're going to see. We want to shift the language. My language is maybe less compelling, but I hope more descriptive, accurate, 
and a guide to reframing your thinking. So I want to see super tools, AI-infused super tools that are reliable, safe, and trustworthy. You're going to hear me say that, reliable, safe, and trustworthy. If it's not, if you're working in a medical situation where life critical needs are around and it's not reliable, safe, and trustworthy, shut it down. Okay, shut it down. That's a bold statement. We're going to look at telebots, ways in which humans are in control and operating devices remotely. We're going to look at control centers and then active appliances are the language I'd like to promote. It'll take you a while to get into it, but I hope they will help you in your thinking. So my favorite super tool is that digital camera in your, on your phone. It's got lots of AI. It sets the shutter, focus, color balance, reduces hand jitter. Yet, yet, it's your photo. You frame it, you compose it, you zoom, and it's your decisive moment when you take the picture when the right pose is there. When I was taking pictures and when James looks up at Jody, that's my moment. I get that picture because I'm looking for a story to tell and it's my photo. Then it builds in all the things I need because I can edit, I can clean it up, I can discard it, and I'm socially connected. And the goals of good technology design have been and will remain, I believe, support self-efficacy, support human creativity, Clarify responsibility and advance social connectedness. Those are the four principles we're going to look for in good design that is user-centered, community-centered, and society-centered. We see the same design principles in navigation choices here from, from, from the White House downtown, eight miles to the University of Maryland in College Park. Lots of AI. I ask for the route. I get a set of choices. I get a preview, a key design goal, preview. Let the users know what's going to happen next. Okay, and then I get to choose. I can choose the short route through the city um, with lots of stoplights, not too much congestion, or I can take the long route on the Beltway, more scenic, around, but maybe more, more gas consumption. Most decisions have complex multiple dimensions. And it, you may have a certain moment where you say, yeah, I want to see the scenic route, or I haven't been on that scenic route. Let me know. You can't predict what the user's going to want to do. They are individuals. They are different. They're responsive to momentary needs. Similarly, other success things. I start typing University of Maryland. I get a set of rec recommendations. I can ignore them. I can take them. I'm in charge. Text completion, grammar, and so on, auto uh, spell checks, and so on are also part of that environment. A more ambitious super tool might be the Bloomberg terminal. Okay, uh, lots of AI again, okay, lots of AI. Bloomberg takes in 1.6 million articles a day, clusters them, ranks them, and orders them according to the needs of each user who may be interested in a certain country, a certain industry, or even a certain com company. And so it provides the information they want, but they control it, they lay it out, and here what you see is, is the design of a tiled, non-overlap, spatially stable display so that with a glance, the decision maker, the analyst can see what they want, move to the next place, and take action. It's their design, their screen, they get to do what they want. And that's why more than 300,000 people pay more than $20,000 a year to have this on their desktop. That's design. We can all, we might choose different colors and different styles in this, in this old fashioned sort of red, green, and black design, but uh, it's a style that works that the users respond to. Telebots. You'll see a lot of AI people tell you the Mars rovers are autonomous. Of course they're autonomous. Autonomous. It's 200 million miles away and takes 22 minutes for <laughs> a signal to get there. Yeah. They're autonomous in one frame. If you think as a designer, the rapid performance to avoid obstacles, avoid precipices, to adjust the antenna, to adjust the solar panels, all that happens autonomously. But there are 80 people at NASA JPL who are operating this Mars rover at a different scale, at a different way. They're deciding if they see something interesting on the horizon, they go there. They can choose what the, to reframe the mission, okay? They get a preview of what's going to happen, but they can always change it, okay? 
they are also there to deal with problems. The, typically, these robots are not self-repairing. And so they need to deal with the problems that arise. But most importantly, most importantly, in most of these robotic setups will be that they are there to design the next generation of robots. Okay, and that's a very central role. The surgical robots, the journalists love to say surgical robots are better than human robots. Not true. The manufacturer of Da Vinci surgical system, the leading one, says robots don't perform surgery. Robots don't perform surgery. Your surgeon performs surgery using Da Vinci um, by instruments that he or she guides uh, uh, via console. And it's a wonderful device because it allows physicians to make very accurate movements, movements deep inside human body cavities in a way that they could not do with other kinds of instruments. It also allows the keyhole kind of surgery, small incisions that make for better surgery, faster recovery, and often more successful outcomes. So that's what we mean by telebots. Control centers and hospitals which monitor hundreds of devices, which collect aggregate data, which then improve the training of these systems, machine learning to make better algorithms for older adults, for children, for people with different uh, comorbidities. Control centers also support the idea of information abundant displays and human social interaction to take the actions that are needed. The active appliances growing through your house, becoming AI infused, um, which are increasingly part of the world if they're reliable, safe, and trustworthy. That's the message. So your washer, your dryer has sensors, it collects data, and the algorithms get better because the machine learning gets to work on more of the data over time. Your pacemaker, which used to be considered an autonomous device, is becoming user controlled. And then the manufacturer, Medtronics, will monitor 10,000 of these to collect the data to improve performance for young, for old, for special diseases. So that's the story here. The summary reminds you that the language, the metaphors, the visually, visual imagery needs to change. That's where we're going. And the design guidelines, which I've suggested here, there's a much longer discussion elsewhere. The idea of overviews first, zoom and filter, then details on demand, previews, and then allow the user, as in your uh, GPS driving, to uh, select and initiate, and then you monitor execution. But you can change. It's, you're not locked in. You're in control. If you want to take a side route, as I did driving down here, <laughs> you know, I wanted to go to Vista Point. I went to Vista Point, and I could get back on the road and do it. There's a longer set, which I will leave for another time. It's all in the book. This was my COVID project, the Human-Centered AI, to tell the story. Uh, one of the reviews that I really liked said it's one of the most important AI books, not HCI books, but it was an AI book. And so that's brought the right kind of attention that I want. And Forbes magazine gave me a big boost by saying this was the thing for managers because it distilled the stories into a straightforward way. Um, there's a Google group I run with 2,700 people. Once a week, you get a note. Please sign up if you like. Uh, I've already been pleased. People told me they are readers. And it distills the kind of things that are happening. Uh, follow us on Twitter, if there still is a Twitter. Uh, and uh, and you know, take a look at our website for resources. And if you want the book, there's a discount code with Oxford University Press. And so that's the story. Uh, for me, the future is human-centered. This is important. We need to go there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ben. OK, we now have Manish Agarwala. OK, great, thanks. Thanks, everyone, uh, and hello. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I uh, wanted to pick a purposely provocative title here because uh, I wanted to spur some discussion. Hopefully, this talk will spur some discussion at the end. I know the title is a bit extreme, but uh, it's all in an effort to, to get the discussion going. Um, so um, 
Uh, the title, of course, is Unpredictable Black Boxes Are Terrible Interfaces. And uh, I just want to start by unpacking that a little bit. So, um, you know, here's a black box. And most modern AI tools are, are generally black boxes. They take some input and transmute it into some kind of output. So in this case, the box is going to represent DALI, but it could just as easily represent uh, GPT-3 or stable diffusion or really any modern deep neural network where we don't really know what's happening inside of the black box. Now, I've been wanting a new picture for my homepage for quite a while now. <laughs> my, my homepage picture is out of date. So I gave DALI this prompt, right? And a couple seconds later, it produced this image. <laughs> now, now, at many levels, this image is astounding, right? It made a photographic image. All the parts of this image work well together, the background room, the person, the lighting. It all kind of works, right? It's, it's, it's amazing what this thing has produced. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's from the name alone, it's produced an image of someone that's of Indian origin. That also is quite amazing, right? So, uh, so that's great. Um, it, it, it does have some artifacts. The hand doesn't quite look human, right? <laughs> uh, I, I was hoping for uh, someone that looks maybe a little younger and cooler. Um, but, um, but overall, this is an amazing capability, right? We as humans have never had the capability before to take a sequence of words and turn it into an image, right? So that's, that's uh, amazing to me. Um, now, I wanna, I wanna use Dali to do something else, right? Uh, so I wanna construct another image. This is a photograph of the main quad at Stanford uh, and Memorial Church. If you haven't seen this, it's just, uh, just over there. I encourage you to go check it out afterwards. Um, what I wanna do is uh, produce an image of Memorial Church and the main quad, but I wanna put it in Blade Runner style, <laughs> okay? So the film Blade Runner, I think many of us are familiar with this. Uh, when we think of Blade Runner, we think of maybe nighttime, rain, lots of neon signage, uh, food, food stalls and uh, uh, people, <laughs> right? Uh, we think maybe of this. So on the left, we have a, a film still from Blade Runner, right? Lots of neon, as I said. On the right is a photograph that another person took of, uh, of Tokyo, and it's titled Neo Dystopian Tokyo in Blade Runner style. All right, so, uh, so many of us have a sense of what this Blade Runner style is, and um, you know, I wanna convert this, I wanna have a version of this, but in that style. And, uh, and uh, just take a moment to think about what that might be. All right, so now I'm gonna feed this to Dali. This is the first image that I get, right? And uh, you know, it's figured out this kind of neon coloring, a little bit of signage. It looks a little bit like Memorial Church, not that much, but it didn't capture the whole quad. So I, uh, you know, change the prompt and a couple of iterations, I get this, a couple of iterations later. Um, so now we see more of the quad. Um, I want the nighttime rain, so I add to the, to the prompt and I get this, uh, and this is after some more iteration. Uh, I continue to iterate, try to get people and get it more lively. Doesn't quite get there. <laughs> um, and you know, I decide to switch over to making an illustration that would hide some of the artifacts perhaps. Um, and you know, after 21 iterations, I end up with this, right? And um, you know, it's kind of there, but it doesn't really match the image that I had in my head, all right? And this was a lot of trial and error, right? I had to go in and type in different prompts. I only showed you a few of the iterations. You can kind of see all of them on the right side. It took a while 
this is not a good interface, all right? So when I say terrible interfaces, this is what I mean. And it's recognized that it is a lot of work to do this prompt engineering, right? So hence we have sites like PromptBase where you can go and pay for a prompt, right? These people have recognized that there's value in buying prompts. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, this is not an easy task, and there are tons of research papers that are all trying to make prompt engineering better, right? Um, so why is this such a bad interface? Um, well, for that, I want to shift to uh, Don Norman and his book, The Design of Everyday Things. Many of us have probably read this. There's a, there's a great anecdote in this book that I think is illustrative. And so he talks about another kind of black box, a refrigerator, in this case, a white box, I guess. Um, and um, it has two compartments, a freezer and a fresh food compartment. And um, he was having trouble setting the temperature of the refrigerator. And uh, what he has are two dials, one for the freezer, one for the fresh food compartment, and um, these kinds of instructions. And he was trying to set the temperature of the refrigerator using these dials. And, you know, if we see these kinds of dials and these instructions, many of us, Norman included, build a conceptual model that suggests that there are two cooling units. One dial controls the cooling unit for the freezer, and the other one controls the cooling unit for the refrigerator, right? That's the model that we have in our heads for how these controls work. Um, and uh, it turns out that this is not the right model. The right model is this one. There's one dial that controls the cooling unit, and there's another one that controls this valve, right? So these, are, these controls are coupled together in a way that doesn't match the conceptual model. And because of that, uh, uh, Norman couldn't figure out how to adjust the dials to get the temperature that he wanted, right? The, 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 the mapping from the controls to the output temperature was unpredictable, right? He didn't have a predictive conceptual model. So I argue that a good conceptual model lets users predict how input controls map or affect the output con out outputs. And uh, when the conceptual model is not predictive, users have to result resort to lots and lots of trial and error. And this is not a good experience. All right, so let's go back to, to this, right? I, I, I changed the prompt a little bit. I want to be cooler and younger. And, um, <laughs> and, and this is terrible, right? Because um, I don't have a conceptual model for how this thing is working. I can't predict how the input prompt controls the output, right? What, is, what does cool mean to the system, right? Is, uh, does picture represent a photograph or an illustration? I guess it might be a photograph, I don't know. How did I get that, <laughs> right? Now, one thing you might argue is, well, you know, AI, a, a, lot of, a lot of times when we're designing AIs, we're trying to uh, make these models do something that a human could do, right? The Turing test is all about that at, at some level. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, aren't humans great interfaces? <laughs> Well, I would argue that humans are also bad interfaces, right? And it's for the same reasons. We don't have a great conceptual model for what the, what the human is going to do, all right? So at some level, <laughs> uh, I would argue this is a bad interface. But uh, I will also say that uh, humans are a little bit better than current AI for the following reason. We can interact with that human artist. Right? So I can have a conversation. I can start with my prompt, and the artist can ask me what I mean. Right? We can build up a shared semantics. If something is ambiguous or hard to understand, the artist can ask me about it, or I can suggest ways to uh, fix the ambiguity. Right? And at the end of that, we can have maybe <laughs> something that's closer to what I want. <laughs> Right? Uh, uh, from the artist. Um, so, you know, when we interact with a human, we have a conceptual model 
likely that is based on a model of ourselves, right? Um, and uh, that's not always a correct model, but we have that. Um, and we also have this kind of conversational interaction. We can build common ground and shared semantics, uh, and we can repair when there's ambiguity. And those two things are really important for making the interaction work well. Now, some iter iteration is still required, as I showed in the conversation. So this is still not a perfect interface in, in, in some ways, but it's better than current systems, I would argue. All right. In comparison, here's what happens with an AI, right? We either don't have a conceptual model at all, or we have an incorrect one that is based on thinking of the AI as a human, right? And that's almost certainly totally incorrect. <laughs> uh, we can't converse, and there's lots and lots of trial and error. Now, I should point out that there are some people trying to push on this, trying to make these uh, uh, interfaces much more conversational. Um, in fact, there are a lot of researchers trying to do this. Probably many of you in the, in the room are trying to do this. Um, the one thing I would argue, though, is that they're maybe not thinking about it in these terms, about establishing common ground and providing for repair. Um, uh, these are a couple of directions. Uh, there's, uh, here's one more direction that I'm particularly interested in. Um, here, we take a prompt as input into the AI model, and instead of generating the output directly, we generate a, a piece of code that you execute to then produce the output. And you might ask why that's better, but in many ways, I think this is better because we can define the semantics of the code. Right, really precisely. And so uh, it's a, it becomes more of a shared language for talking about the, the outputs with the AI. All right, so two things I want to leave you with. When users can't predict how input controls affect outputs, the interface is terrible. Right? Um, and this will really always be true until we can explain the mappings from inputs to outputs in a way that allows people to form a good conceptual model, a predictive one. And then finally, we can improve these AIs by providing more conversational interfaces. All right, thanks. All right, thank you, Manish. We now have Salima. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Salima. I'm going to be talking about measuring what matters for human AI teams, Ben's not going to like this title, but I'm, it's more, more about the measurements and metrics than, than teaming. OK, so topic of the day is, of course, humans in the loop or AIs in the loop. But what I'd argue is that what's something that's slowing progress is that when we're evaluating our AI systems, we're not measuring this loop. When we're evaluating our AI systems, we're most often asking the question, what can these models do? But what we really need to be doing is asking, what can people do with these models? And I wanted to show this image because this is someone uh, from my team, Victor Dibia, trying to prompt stable diffusion to uh, show an image of a robot helping a human walking on the streets to sort of illustrate that humans partnering with AIs. Um, this is you know, the, the outcome of it, of it, which is you know, a beautiful image, but you know, ironically, the robots are holding each other's hands, and the poor human is walking by himself. <laughs> I think that you know really reflects the state of um, how we evaluate these systems. So when measurements don't reflect what people need and value, bad things can happen. So this is just one example where um, an incident where a Palestinian man's um, uh, "Good morning" post in Arabic was translated to "attack them" in Hebrew. And then he was subsequently arrested. And something that we know from Facebook's communications is that at least one of the ways that they were evaluating their translation feature here um, was by using a metric called blue, which is an industry standard that essentially caps, counts the words that are shared across sentences without considering their meaning. But of course, meaning is probably one of the things that uh, was needed to be preserved most and evaluated for most in this scenario. Um, and so standardized metrics and benchmarks like these um, have actually led to rapid advancements in AI because they allow for these apples to, to apples comparisons across models. But as we've seen, you know, when these metrics don't reflect what people need and value, 
bad things can happen. And when those metrics are then used to make deployment and development decisions, then that's when things can go wrong. And this, this is just, uh, this is well known in the industry. And this is just a survey from uh, 2022 of several natural language generation systems papers. And you can see um, this is showing the citations per year. Uh, the dashed vertical lines here show common criticisms of these types of metrics for not reflecting what people value. Um, yet, you see the number of citations for them being used um, has just only increased. And then these metrics translate to industry. So this is um, a paper from some other folks from Microsoft Research um, who did an interview study um, and then a, a survey after that of 61 practitioners. And what they found was that 85% uh, of the time, uh, teams are using these automated metrics similar to Blue uh, or, or you know, other standardized metrics to evaluate their AI systems. 47% of the time, um, these models gate what gets actually deployed to people or what advances to A-B testing. Someone asked about A-B testing earlier today. And 50% agree that these metrics are a reliable way to assess the performance of our AI systems. So that can be problematic. So on my team, we wanted to measure, figure out what measure, uh, matters for measuring our code generation systems. So code generation, this is an example of a code generation system um, using one of these foundation models, GPT-3, fine-tuned on um, open source libraries. So this takes the natural language prompt and produces a, a full function generation. So super powerful. Currently, the state of the art for measuring these types of systems, code generation models, <clears throat> is to optimize for correctness. So the way that this works is um, you take a function, split it into a function header and body. That gets passed to a code generation system, which produces a bunch of generations. Um, so you'll ask for k generations. They're ranked. Pass those generations through some unit tests provided with the functions. And we see how many pass or fail. So then you can, can compute your metrics over this. So uh, 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 standard um, operationalization of correctness currently is this metric known as pass at k. So here, if you see pass at 2, if you're looking at pass at 2, here none of the top two pass, so this would be a failure. But if you're looking at pass at 10, this would be considered uh, a success. So this is um, how we measure for correctness. But what we see when people are talking about these code generation models is they're not really talking about correctness. They're talking about the impact on productivity and the effort that's saved when they're interacting with them. And so what we wanted to ask on my team is, what do programmers really value from these code generation systems? And so what we did is we um, had um, people, so 46 professional programmers, uh, annotate generations across five different models. Um, over 60 human eval uh, uh, problems. And so we collected 552 uh, annotations, and we were asking these programmers to annotate these generations in terms of correctness, in terms of what they uh, found valuable. So did, would they value seeing this generation? Would it, they value it as, as a starting point? And how much effort it would take them to convert a generation into a solution that uh, passed the unit test. And what we found was that correctness was indeed uh, correlated with value, but effort was almost perfectly correlated with value. Um, and this is the difference with significant. Um, and you can see why this happens if you actually watch people program with these types of generative models. Um, so here is just a, a video of someone uh, interacting with one of these systems. Uh, it's the, the system is showing it, them a generation. They go back, iterate over their prompt to try to get it to do what they want. So they're doing this back and forth, viewing suggestions, et cetera. And so we wanted to get a sense of like what people were spending their time on with these new models. So these are folks on my team who did a study to, with 21 programmers, um, having them complete uh, eight diverse leak code problems. And then they had them uh, retrospectively annotate what they were doing and what they were thinking by looking through videos. And so they had about 3,000 events annotated. Um, and from this, they could uh, break down what people were spending their time on. And interestingly, 51% of people's time was spent interacting with these models. So when they're coding, 
they're, they're actually spending a lot of time just trying to get these models to do what they want, steer it in the right direction, verify, edit the code. And this isn't bad because there's been several studies showing that overall you're saving a lot of time when you're interacting with these models. Um, but the, the, the type of work you're doing is much different. It just demonstrates a huge shift in the type of work that people are doing when they're coding now. Now, instead of coding, they're spending a lot of time trying to steer these models to help them code. Okay, so this takes a lot of effort and, and, and effort matters. And so, you know, what can we do? We know that accuracy and correctness is not, um, does, is not the same as value, and people get a lot of value from, from other things with uh, other uses of these AI models. Um, and so one thing that we can do, an opportunity that we have, is try to, to try to capture effort saved or productivity when we're comparing these models and deciding which ones to de deploy to people. Um, so this is something we tried to do. So we tried to look at uh, other metrics that we could use. So in this case, what you're seeing is um, uh, a ground truth code generation on the left, um, and on the right is um, a, a generation from a model. And so right now, this generation doesn't pass according to our correctness met metric. It doesn't pass the unit test. But you can tell that it's actually quite similar to the ground truth. So what we did is we looked at simple edit distance. We looked at a few different metrics here, but edit, edit similarity is sort of one minus edit distance, and, and used this to see if that was a, a good way to capture effort. Um, and so we did this evaluation where we, we took a, a data set, looked at how people evaluated the generations, um, and we wanted to see if edit similarity might be a good metric um, for, for a good proxy for effort. It wasn't. Uh, it was about 50.51 um, uh, according to Pearson. So it wasn't a great metric for effort. But it did allow us to capture some of what uh, this correctness metric misses. So this is when pass, this pass at K passes, people get a ton of value out of it. But when it fails, people still get a lot of value out of these generations because it doesn't necessarily have to be completely correct, it just has to be close enough. And so if you combine these metrics, um, then you can, in even just a simple way, you can get a much stronger correlation with, with effort and then also value. So using these types of metrics is really important. Um, metrics that actually reflect what people are wanting from these systems is important um, so that we can make good decisions about what to deploy. Uh, another thing that's, another reason why this is important is because when we change um, our objective, we can change what the experience and change what we focus on. Um, so another thing, uh, tech thing that uh, folks on my team looked at recently was techniques for reducing effort in these code generation systems. So they looked at using highlighting um, of tokens, uh, where they were highlighting tokens based on the probability of being edited. So not uncertainty, but is this going to be edited by a person? And again, they had uh, uh, professional programmers do several problems um, and found that highlighting in this way, as opposed to uncertainty, was something that significantly reduced the time uh, to, to interact with these systems. And people strongly preferred it. OK, so to summarize, creating human-centered AI, um, designing better systems, require human-centered metrics that reflect what people value. Um, so I just want to thank folks on my team. We're hiring interns, so apply with us. Thanks for your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Salima. Uh, yeah, yeah, the one with the green yeah, button. The green okay. button. <laughs> All right. Humans. Genevieve. Humans in the loop. Humans with a button. Yeah. All right. Excellent. I'm going to ask everyone to change gears with me. You've just heard two talks about AI. This is all about humans, loops, and control. No AI, no graphs, but at least one image created by an AI, because that seems to be on point and on trend. <laughs> all right. So. I want to begin the way we would begin all conversations in Australia by acknowledging where I am today, which is on the lands of the Alawan people, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present. I want to acknowledge that the work I'm about to share was created on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in my hometown in Canberra, Australia, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present there and acknowledge that that is country that was always sacred and never ceded, and that my country is in the middle of a very long journey around truth and reconciliation. And for me, knowing where my work was created and in which place it began is hugely important when I think about the work I do. 
And I know that this talk will be heard in lots of other places, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present in those places too. You could begin a talk about humans in the loop and humans in control with Norbert Wiener and his work on cybernetics and a book he published in the 1940s where he was beginning to contemplate what it meant to think about computational technology and human beings, or as he framed it in 1946, the, the animal and the technology, the animal and the machine. And for him, it was about the relationship between those two objects and the ways in which that relationship could be described. He believed it was about communication and control. He and his colleagues would go on to generate a great many theories and theoretical and pragmatic approaches to thinking about technology development. AI, of course, proceeds from many of those conversations. And the practitioners who gave us the term AI back in the 1950s were part of earlier conversations about cybernetics in the 1940s. This would, of course, be the requisite computer-generated image. The prompt here was Norbert Wiener in the style of Francis Bacon. Norbert's never looked so good, to be very clear. <laughs> However, I decided I didn't want to talk about 20th century technologies at all, or even 21st century ones. I want to go back to the 19th century. I want to go back to one of the original technologies that creates one of the original loops. I want to go back to telegraphy. And the reason I've picked the 19th century in telegraphy is that I think it gives us a series of ways of problematizing the notion of control. So where do you start? Well, you start with the technology that framed the world. You start with the first technology that connected the world and that, in the words of at least one American politician, annihilated time and space. It meant that information could flow absent physical means. It meant that electricity in the form of batteries generated a single loop that was grounded in multiple places and that spanned the world. It was a combination of different technologies and engineers and complexities. And in Australia in 1872, that technology connected my country to the rest of the world. It took 36,000 wooden and metal poles. It took 3,000 miles of galvanized wire. And it took two years to string a, a line from Adelaide to Darwin and from Darwin to London. And in so doing, changed the way Australia thought about its relationship to the world. It also created a whole series of other kinds of roles and other kinds of humans. The first one, if you squint, is leaning against one of the poles in the veranda there. His name is Andrew Hewish. Andrew Hewish was the telegraph operator of this telegraph station, and his job was to be a human in the loop. For the telegraph to span 3,000 miles across Australia, you required a station every 250 miles to reboost the signal. You had to listen to the telegraphy come in one side, key it into the machine, and send it out the other. He was one of the original humans in the loop, one of the first tech workers. He had a range of skills. He understood Morse code. He understood electrical circuits. He understood batteries. But he also was a sign of telegraphy. He stood in a uniform. He amplified the signal. He wasn't just a human in the loop. He was a human making the loop. For him to do his job, he required rules and regulations and a standards book that was produced somewhere else by a man named Charles Todd. That regulation book demanded that Andrew Hewish turned up in uniform on time, that he did his job. It framed his days. At 8 o'clock in the morning, he sent the weather report to Adelaide. At 12.58 PM, he cleared the line so that at 1 PM, a time signal could go across the entire network. You couldn't be in control unless you had rules, but the rules framed what your control looked like. Of course, if you're Andrew Hewish, living 600 miles from the nearest city, you need, and maintaining a 3,000 mile line, you have other people who you need to make that loop work. This is Tom Hanley. Tom ran a crew of linesmen. They had horses and ladders and insulators and wires and telegraph poles. And their job was to maintain a 250 mile section of the line. That meant they cut a full chain's worth of length, 20 meters. You know, what is that? 20 yards on either side. Uh, they had to fix it every time it broke. They had to maintain it. They were responsible for keeping the loop running so that there could be a human in control. In order for all of those humans to exist, there had to be food. In order for there to be food, there had to be market gardens. This is Ned Chong. Ned Chong comes from Amoy in China. He immigrated to Australia in the 1850s. And by the time he was in his 30s, he was running a market garden in an improbable place called Unadatta. I dare you to Google it. O-O-D-N-A-T-T-A. It is in the middle of nowhere. But there was a market garden there, and Ned ran it. And he supplied the entire area. In order for there to be people living in places in remote areas, you needed to have food. In order for one loop to survive, you had to create a separate loop. 
that loop was a loop of Chinese immigrants who ran market gardens and mercantile relationships across much of the interior of Australia, ensuring that there was fresh food and vegetables, but also creating ties between Chinese communities in Australia and in China itself. And of course, it wasn't just the Chinese who were creating loops. Uh, Jody, wherever you are, your line today about vagrant design and sort of accidental vagrancy made me think of Australian camels, which are also part of this story. So now you've got a telegraph station and a line. You've got repairmen. You've got food. How's it all moving around? Because it isn't on horses and buggies and trains, because none of those were here. It was, in fact, with camels. And a businessman named Thomas Elder, who in the 1850s worked out that if you were going to supply interior Australia, you needed camels. And so he started to import them. But then he realized that if you were going to import camels, you needed people who were experts in working with camels. And so he sponsored immigration for men from South Asia. And the Cameliers came to Australia, where we know them as the Afghans, improbably because they weren't. Uh, they then brought an entire other culture and set of cultural practices with them. Fayette and Tag Mohammed were two such men, brothers. They ran a camel business for a man named Thomas Elders, that same Elders business. They, in turn, worked this same part of the telegraph line in South Australia. They brought camels. They dug wells. They planted palm trees. They sponsored mosques. They brought imams. They brought business. They brought many, 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 many more camels. And those camels extended the range of the telegraph line and of those humans and of all those businesses. And the reason, Jody, it made me think of that is when Faiz and Tayet stopped bringing in camels, the camels didn't stop themselves. And now there are somewhere between 500 and <coughs> 750,000 camels in Australia. We call them feral rather than accidentally vagrant, but it's the same principle. <laughs> Turns out when you create one loop, you create others, and they don't always unfold the way you expected. And of course, once you've got a line, not everyone once thinks the line should be there. In 1883, a young boy named William and six of his friends took slingshots and spent an afternoon on the Kapunda Road shattering the insulators on the telegraph poles because you know it sounded good. And you know there's nothing like shattering porcelain at 10 feet above the ground in tension to think that's a good way to spend an afternoon as a 10-year-old boy in a remote country town. They were, of course, arrested. They were charged with the malicious crime of throwing stones at a telegraph line. The police in South Australia were then cautioned to go to every school in South Australia and explain to people this was not a good thing, thus, of course, ensuring that a whole lot of people who didn't know that it was a crime or even a possibility before went, oh, hey, I'm in on that. Of course, there were other people disrupting the line too. If you were a lost traveller in Australia, walking your way to the telegraph line and cutting it ensured you would be saved because you were never more than 250 miles from a repeater station. And there is at least one account in the newspapers of someone who hitchhiked north by cutting the line and being taken to the next repeater station and doing it three times before he was arrested <laughs> for possibly inappropriate use of a telegraphy system. But you have to admire the entrepreneurial spirit of it. <laughs> of course, for the First Nations people across whose land these lines went, disrupting the line was about something else. It was about resisting colonial impost. It was about resisting the structuring of this force. And sometimes it was just about the pragmatics of the fact that insulators were much easier to shatter and make into sharp points than flint. And the wire made excellent fishing hooks. But nonetheless, once you have a system, disrupting it is part of what it means to think about it. Control and its opposite, which isn't always a lack of control, might sometimes be about disruption and resistance. And of course, all of that, that entire telegraphy system, that entire loop, was happening on a place that had always and already been Arabana land, at least in this particular instance in northern South Australia. It's a land that was given form by ancestral spirits, in this case, the old man black snake and the old man red belly black snake who crawled across this country and gave it form and meaning, gave the people who live there now responsibilities for that country. They would not talk about being in control of that place. They would talk about being responsible for that place, as they would say always was, always will be. So when we think about a line that unfolds, it unfolds in multiple ways with multiple constituencies and multiple characteristics. So how do you put those seven tiny fragments of history back together? Well, for me, you do it in two ways. One is to say talking about control is never just talking about control. Talking about control is talking about a whole series of other kinds of ways of encountering and engaging with technical systems. It might be about 
extending the reach of that system or amplifying its range or ma maintaining and supplying it, banal and boring as they may be, hugely important, as you heard multiple people talk about this morning, to making those systems work. It might be about the rules and regulations given by one regime or imposed by another, and all of those are also, also about power, about who has it and who doesn't. For me, evoking this set of stories is also a way of saying, how is it that we want to think about humans in control? Which humans? Who's being celebrated? Who's being erased? I can do a very good job of telling you all those stories, but did you hear me say a woman's name? No. Are there women in this story? Yes, but they're even harder to find than the stories that are here. I could tell you about Bessie, who is Ned's wife. I can tell you about Mary, who is Albert's wife. I can tell you about a number of those women, but finding the other humans that are necessary for these humans to be there is part and parcel of what it might mean. So who are the humans in control? Who are the humans that let that happen? Who are the humans upon whose bodies that control is being written? What is the loop? What are the other loops? What are the loops that that loop creates and the loops that it might erase, replace, supplant, and how might you unpack all of that? For me means that as we flash forward to the 21st century and want to talk about AI, these are conversations we've already had. These are lessons we've already learned. These are places we can go looking to think about how we inform our choices moving forward. And with that, I'm going to stop and say thank you. Thank you. All right. Elizabeth, bring it home. Th yeah, thanks for letting me follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you very much uh, for giving me your attention before the break. Um, first of all, I loved, I loved the way you acknowledged the land. I'm going to start by, start by acknowledging the people. So AI didn't create this conference. It was created by people. Um, and my research I'm about to share was created by a, a whole host of folks here, are just uh, some of them. Nothing happens alone. So show of hands, I would like to see who all is sat completely satisfied with every human relation um, collaboration they have. Just raise your hand. OK, how, let's, let's modify that. How, how about are you satisfied with some of your human relationships? OK, this is good. Great. Functional crowd. Uh, let's go into another one. How many are satisfied with your, all your relationships with AI? 100% perfect relationship. Come on, let me see it. OK. Oh, nice. Thank you, one brave soul. AI is really working for you. That's great. Um, let's modify that and say some. How many are satisfied with some of the relationships? OK, good. What this um, scientific study just showed me is that there is room for improvement in both human relationships and our relationships with AI. And this is wonderful because this is, this is what I study. I am trained as a designer and a management scientist. And my vision that's been repeated in different ways, slightly different, is that I would like to collect, collectively have us design a future of work that represents us people and works for us people. So represents, I think Genevieve just added a lovely commentary on representation. Uh, I do not think our current systems represent all of us, nor do I think they work for all of us. So how are we going to do this? First of all, um, a, a story, um, hopefully a, a story of Google Glass that came out in 1914. That would have been funny. Um, 2014. Um, we learned from this that AI, well, the technology can only reach people if they want it. None of you are wearing AI glasses in the room. It was all of you were supposed to be wearing them if you got the memo in, in uh, 2014. But we didn't want to, right? We didn't want to because they invaded our privacy. We didn't want to because it changed human interaction. There's so many reasons we didn't want to. And so this is just, remember Google Glass when you're thinking about what can AI do. People have to want it. So I'm going to argue that designing AI that people want is as important as making sure it works. This is a picture of my child during Zoom school, who had the privilege of having children or being in Zoom school, right? Best time of your life. Um, this is my child, heads up, head up against um, their head, because they had just worked with an intelligent math tutor and never wanted to do math again. Prior to this, they loved math. So again, we must design systems, not only that work, the intelligent tutor worked, but um, it made my child 
disinterested in math. It made him not motivated to do math and a series of other things. We are still recovering from use of AI tutor during Zoom. So this is a future, because again, prerequisite, we all needed, I guess, a picture of Dolly. Um, this is a picture when I typed in an unmotivated, dissatisfied workforce. Um, and, uh, oh, unmotivated, in, ineffective, unsatisfied people on the Stanford campus, by the way. Um, so this is, this, is, this is your future, James um, and Russ. Uh, I don't want this, and if anybody wants this in the room, let's talk at lunch. Um, so, how are we going to avoid this future? Here's what, well, first of all, let me celebrate. AI is doing great things. We've already talked about that. Go AI. I'm, I'm supportive. But what we really need to do is we need to reframe the, the question of what, what can't AI do, but what's the optimal fit between our work, and when I say our work, I mean us as human beings, what we do, and what AI can do. So it's about the conversation between our work, the work that brings us meaning, the work that brings us satisfaction, and what AI can do. So we got to go back in time, 1914, not quite as early as Genevieve. Um, here is the Ford manufacturing plant. A man by the name of Frederick Taylor was working with Ford to develop what he called scientific management, which sounds strangely like some of the things we're doing right now. He wanted to make car making more efficient. So he broke, anybody who knows the story, broke down all the components of car making. So instead of a team making a whole car, he would have one person that was just really good at putting in this left front wheel. And that's all you did all day, left front wheel, left front wheel. And because of this, um, Ford was able to make a car in 93 minutes. That was radical at the time. He was also able to pay his workers $5 a day, which was twice as much as the daily average. So people were getting paid well. Ford had a, a dominated the market with 43% of the market. But what, were the, what was the workers' experience? Dissatisfaction, uninterested, bored. Because they were only doing a part of it. So what are we going to do about this? How do we frame this? This is a, dual, this is a solvable problem. Um, James Hackman and um, Greg Oldham in the 1980s were really interested in why organizations were losing all sorts of people. They were having a hard time retaining their employees. Does this sound like the pandemic, right? We're losing employees. What do we do? Where do we go? I'm going to share with you a model that they presented years ago that still holds true today. So the first part of the model is that high level, there are characteristics of jobs that lead to critical psychological states that lead to outcomes, which are both satisfaction and work efficacy. The job characteristics are these, and I'm going to illustrate these. I'm going to go through each of these, illustrating how they come play out in my uh, work as a researcher and a professor. Um, I'm going to show how they, they lead to meaningful work, how they lead to responsibility of work outcomes, and how they lead to the actual knowledge of the results of the work. And then, as I said, lead to growth outcome, growth satisfaction, um, job satisfaction, and efficacy. You can have both. You can have satisfied workers and effective workers. It is possible. So skill variety. This is really just a fancy word for how much variety do you have. As a professor, I get to work with many people and apply many skills. Hi, I'm very lucky to have high skill variety. Task identity is just about, is there a middle, beginning, and end? Yes, indeed, I work on the academic calendar. I start with convocation. I end with commencement. Beginning, middle, and end. Significance. This is, is my work significant? Yes, I am so lucky to impact the development of students, faculty, et cetera, as I'm sure many of you are. Autonomy, pretty straightforward. We've talked about this. How much independence do I have? Yes, I get to design my own curriculum. I design this talk. I get to, get to do what I want. And then feedback, how much someone knows about their performance. Where do I receive feedback? My particular lab has been really interested in this last one, feedback. You may think in a world abundant with information, feedback is everywhere. Well, guess what? It's actually, there's a lot of information, but not a lot of great feedback. So we've been looking, using this model and focusing in on feedback to think, how can we change feedback to get better work outcomes? So I'm going to give you just a few examples um, of how we've done this concretely. So you can imagine potentially using this model to design your AI systems. So as I said, we've mostly focused on feedback support technology. And um, 
the one important thing that's, that's critical about this is we haven't assumed what people are needing. We've gone in and worked directly with people, much like Jody was talking about working with um, the hospitality industry. You must work with people rather than assume what they need. So here's a first project. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a meeting where people showed up unprepared. OK, you're liars if nobody's raising your hand. Um, this, was, this was a tool that uh, had prompts, instilled prompts in people leading a week leading up to the meeting at different intervals to get them to be thinking about the topics and bring information in. When they came in, they then had this interactive board that they could start the conversation with. Another example, preparing for feedback. Um, how, many, how many teachers in the room have given feedback and not had it heard or acted upon? OK, great. I won't ask the students to raise your hand if you've, I'll raise my hand. As a student, I was given feedback that I didn't act upon. Waste of time. Um, so this is a tool that, um, that helps basically people prepare and act on the feedback given. Another one um, that we came up with is pairing. So oftentimes you show up at these meetings, who do you talk with, who do you get help from? This is an algorithm that we developed that helps you um, ask for what you want and pairs with somebody who is likely to be able to help you. But it's not just, it, it's careful to not just pair people that it always pairs you with. It also is interested in having you broaden your, um, your connections within the group. So it also varies based on the last time you met with a particular person. So this ensures that you're not only um, getting help, but you're also um, getting help and extending your network. And then um, a second to last one is scaffolding feedback. It turns out that when you're getting feedback from a lot of um, inex novices, um, we can actually figure out a way of scaffolding the feedback um, in such a way that you can actually get feedback that is as good as experts from many novices. So this was in the case in which you're, you can't get a hold of your, um, the expert or your boss or what have you. Can you go to a broader group of people and get feedback that's just as good? And then lastly, and perhaps my most important design, is um, a non-AI system. This, is, um, this was based on people, it turns out in feedback, people have a hard time receiving feedback. I know this sounds shocking, but it's true. Um, and what we realized is we were going to create a system. That was the plan. We are going to create a technical system. And what we realized is all we needed was a script. We needed a verbal script. No technology needed. So, I like to remind you that sometimes no AI is the best AI. Please remember that as you're designing, if you take this human-centered approach and design for people's work and the way that you're doing it and look at their pain points, please remember sometimes you just need a script. So my call to folks in the room is please, please um, consider this. Instead of taking the AI first approach, as we've, we've been hearing, take um, the human-centric approach. Design and iteratively test with people to augment these job characteristics I sh showed you. And I'll conclude with a final thing. I am an alumni of Stanford. I was privileged to receive this um, alumni magazine, ripped, but still in my mail. This is, this is my doorstep. Thank you, Stanford Business School. Um, and I was struck, and this relates to Ben's talk, I was struck by the language of the, the title of the article, if you can see it through the rip. It says, how to survive the AI revolution. And I think this is the wrong framing. Surviving is not what I want to be. I want to be thriving. So please, join with me and help to help us to thrive in the AI revolution. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Thank you Liz. OK, we're going to first have a conversation on stage. Um, but first, what I want you to do is you've been sitting a while. So everyone just stand up and yeah. stretch for 10 okay. seconds. It's not in my <laughs> script, but I could see it. OK, OK, good. I don't need I don't need my audience dropping over from this. All right, okay, let's let's now have a conversation. <laughs> wow. We've gone all the way, I feel, from you know uh, anthropology 101 uh, <laughs> to HCI 101. Manish, I feel like I just taught that lecture last week and um, it was great to hear. Um, I heard a few themes come up. I heard in a lot of our talks this word reframe. We heard it from Jody as well. I'm kind of curious, what do you think is the key thing we need to reframe 
in our thinking about how to design for AI versus designing for other products that we know a lot about. Yeah. Oh, sure. I, I think we've all been saying it. It's put humans first, and human needs drive innovation. Uh, I think that's where you want to go. Uh, we want to provide the kind of things that support human self-efficacy, creativity, responsibility, and social connectedness. That's the key. Okay, so one question I would ask is, you know, many of us teach user-centered design, human-centered design. Isn't that what we do? Is there something new that we need to pick up because it's an AI based Yeah, system? I mean, take a look at the example Manish gave. I mean, look what happens when someone who doesn't get it is designing the prompt system, okay? It's, why is it a conversational thing? Why is it a natural language interface? When it's a great place for a design of a structured prompt that would have the different components to remind you of the semantics of prompt formation, of the possibilities. It enriches you by having a more structured approach. And so the instinct that says that, that human computer interaction should be based on human interaction is suboptimal. It's a poor design. Cliff Nass here sadly died early, a wonderful psychology professor, great guy who had developed the ideas of computers as social actors, later recanted and said humans can't be teammates. Uh, AI can't be teammates, okay? Article with Virginia Groom. So that is the change. That's the reframing. He got it. It took him a while. He had to go through that to understand that human-human interaction is not the best model. We have better ways to design and changing from natural language interaction is an obvious one. Elon Musk says, people have eyes, therefore my car will have video cameras. Not LiDAR, not a good idea, okay? So there's lots of ways we should get past that model, reframe to the idea of designing tools, super tools, telebots, active appliances. Okay. Salima, do you have a thought there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I, I agree with that and I think one, you know, in terms of reframing, I would say we have to reframe some of our processes. So even if there are people like designers or folks who understand the sort of human-centered principles, a lot of those people aren't in the room making the decisions about what gets built. And I think that the whole, we have to rethink our whole, our processes and have those folks there working with the technologists, working with the AI people up front and early on. Great. Any thoughts, Genevieve or Liz? Sure, uh, I would say that um, capitalism still rules. Not that's not my personal opinion. That's just a fact. Um, and and so, and so the con <laughs> the consequence of that is that, um, and I, I was trying to allude to in my talk is that productivity is going to matter. We can't ignore productivity, but we need to think about it with how people are also productive not just how machines are productive. And I think we're just missing, we're really forgetting um, about people productivity. And in user-centered design, we usually look at what's called like the bugs, things that don't work. And I feel like right now we're designing just to, we're not focusing on the bugs, we're just like it's a whole re, re makeover on the human being, human makeover, as opposed to just the things that don't work. And I think that's, it's not gonna get us to a more productive place as long as capitalism rules. Yeah, I, thought, uh, I think that's great that you brought it up because you know I had capitalism question mark. Um, <laughs> yes, um, we do have it. Though I didn't know if I heard anyone say it, but I, w I was really curious, like how does that really affect a lot of these metrics, which was also you know, related to, I think, Salima and Genevieve's talk about what we're measuring, what are, what are our goals? Like, should I throw up my hands because of capitalism or how do we, hack around that, what are the disruptions that need to happen to make these new tools work better? I mean, I think in terms of metrics, I really like the framing of the job characteristics. And I think, you know, right, I talked about metrics in terms of like the immediate, you know, uh, productivity gains and how people are interacting with these, these things. But, you know, there's the downstream things that we need to consider and, and how, how these autonomous tools or, you know, um, uh, support systems actually impact the people who are working there. And, you know, in the long run, is it going to take away their autonomy, their freedom, and make them, you know, unhappy? I think the downstream effects are even harder to measure and, and then um, optimize for in these systems. 
And I guess the only piece I'd add, James, and it's always really striking to me when I think about the telegraphy example, right, is that a similar bundle of technology unfolds completely different in different countries. Mm -hmm. And it unfolds differently in different countries because you have different governments, different histories, different cultures, different variations on capitalism, which while it may rule in that sense, it doesn't look the same in different places. And so there is a little bit here of AIs AIs aren't only being built by large American companies, they're being built by governments, by companies who are headquartered and cultured in other places. And whilst productivity is certainly part of it, we know there are other underlying motivations for building large technical systems and other kind of variations. You know, if it weren't 12 minutes, I might have reflected on why the British government chose to roll telegraphy out all over the world, a technology that, by the way, made them no money for 50 years. So, you know, the British government subsidizes undersea cables, has a lock on controlling telegraphy in about sort of 50 of the 100 years that the telegraphy is big. And for them, it was about shortening the distance between the home office in Britain and their colonial apparatus. So they connect India 10 years, 15 years before they connect Australia because we weren't doing anything that anyone cared about, whereas British control in India was much more fraught. And so there's a piece about what the motives of various large entities, not all of them capitalists, not all of them commercial, will be here and being sensitive to the fact that, yes, productivity is a metric, but so is control, so is surveillance. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you wanted to say, James, where's the reframing, for me, I'm not usually talking about the past, as you know, I'm usually talking about the future. And one of the things we joke about Australia is we're living in the future by at least, you know, 17 hours. <laughs> Sometimes 18. Exactly. <laughs> Depends on the time zone. Uh, you know, 21 if you're in Perth. Um, and one of the things about living in the future, even just that little much, means that we're also acutely aware that you can't talk about technological apparatus without talking about climate and sustainability and energy. And so one of the things for me that's missing whenever we talk about humans in control is we are back to, for better or worse, Ben and I both reject the image of the god hand and the robot hand, but I think we should be similarly critical of the language of humans in control when we sit in a time and a place where thinking about the environment, the ecosystem, climate change and sustainability might also need to be part of the locus here. And certainly there's at least one AI running in Sydney that I can think of that's entirely about energy saving. That's, it's, so it's not productivity in that sense. It's about mm -hmm. dropping the energy bill of a particular building. And humans are definitely not in control of that. And it's running a smart elevator system, which means that humans wait longer in order that more energy is saved. And the elevator has trained humans to wait longer. It only took about 18 months. <laughs> and there's something there about what it means to assert humans in control are. I can, you know, problematize all the humans that are in and out of control, but I do wonder about what's then also missing that's a constituency in that conversation. For me, that would be about, well, both governmental regimes and the environment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. animals yeah. and nature. And that. I, I mean, Genevieve's wonderful holistic view of the context of technology implementation is really central. And it goes directly against what what James had in his opening talk talked about Jeff uh, Hinton's narrow, task-focused issue about the, the radiologist. And so the, the notion that uh, the, the rationalist fever dream, which is that you can decompose work into these small buckets, is really destroyed by Genevieve's clarity about the large context we have to do, and human systems are there. Humans are different from computers. It's a category error to suggest that computers are like people. Well, and I, I'm also, I'm kind of struck when I read back into the 1940s where they're not even talking about humans, they're talking about animals, where they imagine that humans are an animal, but they're equally interested in a wider range of them. So for me, there's a little bit here about how do we think about and want to center around the non-human as well as the human actors in all of this, which for me would be a different way of breaking that frame, James. Yeah, I want to just quickly draw attention to a slide that may have gone by on Jody's. She referenced Donella Williams Systems mm -hmm. yep. work, and this is old work that's brilliant, and I think she was well ahead of her time in understanding the way we need to look at systems, and I think offers really compelling frameworks um, for people to check out, so okay. please. Check her, her work out. Okay, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, Manish brought up conceptual models, and I said this is really a basic thing that we <coughs> teach in, you know, introductory design or HCI. And it seems easier said than done. You know, you give me that fridge, and 
I've designed it. I've redesigned it every year for 25 years, so I know how to do it. Um, but do we know what some good conceptual models are for smart systems? You know, clearly people are using the black box, which is not a good one. We, we heard about the conversational agent. Maybe it works in certain um, domains. Do we, do we know of good conceptual models? And secondly, is it harder to create these for intelligent systems than it is for you know, any old system I'm building that doesn't have AI? Though I'll claim there won't be too many of those um, much longer. Any thoughts on the difficulty of designing conceptual models and are there good ones out there? Yeah, so uh, you know, I think this is uh, really dependent on the capabilities of the AI system that you're building. Um, you know, for a lot of these models, no one really knows what they're doing at a, at a causal level inside of the inside of the system, and so that makes it very difficult to convey a conceptual model that is that is somewhat predictive. Um, I think the other direction that, that I sort of proposed in the, in the talk is that um, by establishing shared semantics and common ground with the system, we might be able to make better interfaces. They still won't be perfect, but at least they'll move in the direction of being a little better. So, um, so I can see movement in that direction. Uh, I've seen less work on trying to really establish good conceptual models of, of, of these black boxes. I, I'm curious whether, Ben, these terms you yeah. used as alternative terms, do they allow me also to develop better conceptual exactly. models? Exactly. That's, that's exactly where we're going. I think we want to find those models that are comprehensible, predictable, and controllable. I think that's still the durable notion, and the notions of direct manipulation that you're in charge and that you can override it. So we come to depend on reliable, safe, and trustworthy things. Our, our camera sets the shutter, the focus, the color balance. But if we see that the focus is wrong, we can adjust that. So we're there. We're still in charge. It's the humans in charge. That's, that's the title of the conference, humans in charge. And I think that mental model should be there so that users have the control panel by which they can get what they want and then the system gives them some previews, some offer, some opportunities, but they can override. I want to give a one minute warning that we'll start taking yeah. questions from the audience in about a minute. So if you have your question, as you know, we always cut it off early. So go ahead, James. Thanks. <laughs> Did, any comments on good conceptual models that we've seen or how to develop on? Is it harder for smart systems? Well, look, I mean, I think, again, I'm, I'm going to kind of give something completely off the side of this. That's um, why you're here. I know. That's <laughs> why you use me, James. I recognize that. Um, some of my colleagues in Australia have been building a set of neural nets that they've been training on Aboriginal Dreamtime stories in language and using uh, two different variants of a story where different pieces of a nation will know different parts of the story, and so using those as the training data sets to generate a, um, a phenomena to power an art installation. Um, and so for me, I was really interested in starting to think about how was AI being used here, not in the context of productivities and efficiencies, but in the context of creating both, in this particular instance, an ancestral figure's ability to appear in the 21st century. Uh, and then a way of kind of manifesting what that would look like. If you're interested in it, you can find it on the website trackerdataproject.com.au. Uh, but it was about how do we think about using some of AI's techniques to do something very different. And then, you know, for those of us who've been around for a while, that should sound vaguely familiar because the notion of computation and creativity has a long history dating back to the first AI conference when McCarthy is pondering whether you and AI will make music through the 1960s and 1970s where we saw lots of computers being used in a variety of ways to make art. Uh, and for me, there was sort of something interesting about a very different set of conceptual models being deployed for a very different kind of intentionality, right? And I think okay. I find those interesting. And that, and that will be a great segue later today when we introduce our next conference on art and creativity in AI. So that, that's good. Let's go to the microphone back here. Remember to please introduce yourself briefly before yes, you Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Anna Ilieska. I'm a Mellon Fellow at the Stanford Humanities Center and lecturer in the Division of Languages, Cultures, and 
something else. There was another L at Stanford <laughs> University. Um, but you get the point. I'm from the humanities, so I am very happy that you just announced the next conference because this is exactly what my question would have been. So by a show of hands, how many literature scholars are there in the room today? <laughs> I knew that, I knew that. Six. Very, very, six people. That is a very small amount of representatives of the very field that studies humanity in charge, the humanities, right? Literature in particular. So what I'm very curious about is how would you, as all the panelists today, where do you see our contribution? What is the role of literature um, in what you do? How can we really contribute to your work? There is a lot of conversation about all of the topics, literally every topic that you've discussed today I could give you an example from philosophy of literature or literature that illustrates some of those points, specifically around human values, about what we value, about truth concepts, uh, but somehow the conversation isn't taking place. I asked a very similar question as this one exactly a year ago when I came to Stanford for the first time from the University of Chicago. So I also would like to know where do we stand from that point of view. Thank you so much. Great I've question. learned a lot today. Can I, can I make you feel just marginally better, but also tell you you're going to have to come to Australia? <laughs> will, that, will, that, will that work as an answer? <laughs> so uh, about two years ago, I was asked by the president of the Australian National University to start a new school at the university, first school in 40 years. Uh, it sits inside what is now the College of Engineering, Computing, and Cybernetics. We just renamed it. Uh, and I'm the director of the School of Cybernetics. The school's got three research clusters in it. One looking at how you take cybernetics as a theoretical concept and use it as a tool. One around how we think about using cybernetics as a way to drive different kinds of business and work and NGO activity. And the third one is around what I think the function of all of us in my school in particular is, which is to tell stories about a future or futures that are more hopeful, equitable, and just than the present in which we find ourselves, and then to actively break the present in order to make that possible. That means that cluster has three things going on. One, it has artists in residence. Uh, first tranche will be announced in a week. Secondly, I'm about to hire my first comparative literature professor in that space. And the third thing is that all we do there is think about the stories we tell and why those stories do and don't resonate, and how we can, through doing that actively, I'm going to use a complicated word here, because it's complicated in its own politic, uh, decolonize the imagination we have for the stories we tell about AI so that we can get partly to Ben's point about how do we mobilize a different set of metaphors, but that also means how do we invite a different set of people into the conversation. So now I endlessly frustrate the engineers and computer scientists I work with who think that anthropology and comparative literature are obviously the same thing. <laughs> Other comments? Yeah. No, yeah, well, I'll just add. So, in preparation for this, Sam, um, James asked me a while to go to come up, and I was really thinking, what am I going to talk about? So, I started asking all my colleagues across different fields, "Hey, what can AI do for you?" Like that was my question. Would you like AI in your life, <laughs> in your work life in particular? And if so, what would it do? And I was really struck. I talked to many, many humanities professors, and I was really struck by the, the not struck, not surprised. They just said, "I." I, don't, I love to write. Like write is, writing brings me joy. It's hard, but it brings me joy. I love to be in the studio. I love to paint. I don't want AI to make the art for me. I want to make the art. And that's really actually that was the genesis of this of this talk was people saying, these are the parts of my job I love and that I want to do and that make me human. And so I think the humanities jobs is the humanist job. And quite frankly, the technologist's job is to remind us of what, who we are and the world we want to live in. I am not an avatar, although it may appear that. I wanted to show up here in person and deliver a talk. You all chose to take time out of your busy life to be here in person and process the information. So I pay an immense gratitude for you reminding us of what it means to be human. I want to stress that we value our remote participants. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Love you guys too. Value you too. <laughs> but there's still humans behind a screen. I Are you still? I don't know. Maybe you have some non-humans attending. I don't know. What's your non-human attendance? Well, the, the, all the questions look very human. Yeah. yeah okay. I, I was just going to say, for <laughs> us <laughs> here at HAI, we value the, the humanities and our colleagues in this work. So you know. We have a, a faculty leadership that includes, um, you know, a professor of English, um, Michelle Elam, who will be one of the leaders of that next conference. Um, 
We also sponsor postdocs and other uh, scholars in the humanities. And I would say in my own research, I actually have two different projects that use narrative story as kind of the metaphor and the way that these AI systems are structured. One in a tutoring system that I hope is not as bad as what your uh, daughter got. <laughs> and, um, and the other in a behavior change application. And both of those projects I have a collaboration with an English professor who is a narratologist, which is a term I didn't know existed uh, three or four years ago. So we all, even us computer scientists, can learn. OK, so we, we have some have questions some over here. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Diamond from the SETI Institute. Yes, we do exactly what you think we do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we also true? use a lot of AI and machine learning. And no, that shouldn't scare you. Um, but I had a question about uh, this conceptual model that you were talking about, um, because when you had that wonderful example of the refrigerator and the freezer, um, it came across as though the user had the wrong conceptual model. In other words, it was the fault of the user for having the wrong conceptual model of how the fridge and the freezer control system actually worked. When it seems to me then, what is the responsibility of the designer of the freezer and the refrigerator to understand the conceptual model that somebody's likely to have and then adapt to that, either in terms of informing them no, your conceptual model is wrong, and here's a different one. Or, yes, I understand what your conceptual model is, and so we're, we're going to actually make it easier for you to understand how this actually works, because it doesn't work the way you think it does. But, but we understand the way you think it does, so we can make that easier for you to, to set those controls. So, so yeah. that's the, the essence of my question is, how do we deal with this issue of, of the conceptual, the re responsibility of, of us having the right conceptual models versus the responsibility of those developing tools, systems, whether it's AI or, or hardware or whatever, uh, in terms of understanding what conceptual models we have? Yeah, great question. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, you know, uh, I didn't give the full example, but we teach this in, in, in the HCI classes. Uh, it's never the fault of the user, <laughs> right? Um, the, the, the responsibility of the designer of the system is to give the user enough of a conceptual model that they can control the thing well, right? And there are lots of ways to do that, but one way is to uh, you know, inform them about what the real system model is. Another way is to make controls that work well with the conceptual model that the person has, right? That is predictive. Uh, and, um, and so it, it's really the responsibility of designers to make sure that that happens. And the same is true in, in, in AI systems. I really think that if we're thinking about uh, AI in the loop and humans in charge, the designers of the AI <laughs> and the systems need to think about how to pr you know, provide a conceptual model that uh, someone can work with. Right now, I think for many of us, the conceptual model is that the AI, you know, it's a proxy for another human. Right? Our model is, is another human. And we should, we should move away from that. It's the same thing with the robot hand and the human hand. Right? That, that's an incorrect model. I think we would all agree that's a totally incorrect model. And we should think about how to move away from that. Okay. I want to have one question virtual. OK, let's if go to a okay, virtual just to question. Make sure, cause out of if respect you just hold these, on back there. Yeah. Uh, Christina McElloran says, humans in charge is problematic when humans are biased and mistake-ridden. Oh. Should people be the benchmark, benchmark or the final authority? Racist, sexist, ableist humans generate lots of suffering. I, she says, uh, or they say, would rather face an algorithm without human interference in a number of contexts. Oh, Thank you for that question. <laughs> Want to take that? You said, oh. like, you know, an answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, you know, th this... This denial of human expertise. Yes, humans make mistakes, but they're also remarkable in their creativity and their capacity for expertise. Gary Klein, who's a hero for me in this direction, makes a very strong and clear message about that. What we really need to do is build machines that make smart people smarter. We want to enhance their ability. We, we understand that in a lot of designs of, by having uh, limitations, guardrails, um, interlocks, these are all the things that have gone in the human factors literature for 70 years about how we prevent failure. So your, your self-cleaning oven, once the temperature is above 600 degrees Fahrenheit, you can't open the door, okay? And that's built into a lot of technologies. That's design at work. 
That's the right kind of design. We need to build more of that. And we need to enhance human expertise while lowering the chance of errors. Absolutely. I'm going to take a question back here. Thank you all. Uh, excellent panel discussion. I'm Ala Youssef. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford Amy Center. I think a lot about ethics and policy and how we develop and design AI tools for clinical practices. I guess one of the questions that this conference has provoked me is, what are the competencies of the humans who are in charge? How we develop that? Is there specific expectations, accountability measures? Um, if we're thinking of training the next generation of leaders, what should be the competencies we design curriculum and training programs for them? Communication. Communication is the way we understand each other's comp uh, conceptual models. It's the way we understand people's motivations when there's bias. We, we can overcome a lot through communication, and too little um, has been done in this. I teach a class of PhD students who are brilliant thinkers but can't share their work in a single sentence. <laughs> That's not just my university. That is this university. That is every university. And that is problematic. And I, I'm walking over here, I was having coffee with a friend, and he said, really, is it that, he was going to teach his class in AI, he said, really, is it that fundamental? Do we just have to teach communication? I said, yeah, I think it's just communication. Gentlemen. And civic participation. Yes. And I'd add two more pieces to yeah, the And move to Australia. Yeah, like, obviously, it's just, it's still just going to be my answer, and I'm hiring. <laughs> I'm just going to keep starting, just doing that, right? Well, you know, it's, it's nice there. I've you know, got advantages. I think there's two more pieces, right? One, yeah. I also think, while we talk a lot about the value of having multiple disciplines in the conversation, we aren't good at framing how to have that conversation. Yes, absolutely. So there are too many places where, as a social scientist, I'm asked to talk about, just tell me about what the humans do in this instance. And when yeah. I want to give a critique of power or race right. or anything else, I'm told, no, 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 I just want to know the, the, the human bit. I'm like, well, actually, my discipline comes with those lenses too, so you can't have one piece without the other. So I think there's a bit about how do we move from having multiple disciplines in the room to framing a conversation that produces something as a result of that. I've got an so, AI for that. <laughs> I don't believe you. Sorry. Um, you seem lovely, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been framing that as talking about productive discomfort. So how do you teach people to be good at being in a place where it feels uncomfortable? So I think that's both about how do we teach our students that, how do we teach the next generation of leaders, but how do we be good at managing that too, mm -hmm. right? It's one thing to celebrate diversity and inclusion. It's another thing to realize that to make that work effectively, you actually need a different set of leadership tools and techniques. And so for me, communication, number one, but number two, an ability to both manage with and look towards productive discomfort, because I think that's actually, for me, a critical piece of the puzzle too. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. I would like to take the question from the young computer science professor in the nice sports coat. <laughs> uh, Eric Polis, I am a human, not an AI. Um, go Bears, I'm from UC Berkeley, so I'm required to say that during big game week. Um, thank you for this great panel. Uh, I'm actually um, curious because I love this narrative that Genevieve brought us about the telegraph operators. And partially, uh, I loved hearing about the humans, but it was also reflecting on that moment where they were kind of bending towards this very machine vernacular, these dots and dashes. And in some sense, that is very much about kind of the early encounter of things. But I also was thinking about the next iteration of that, where individuals were talking on phones, and I know you're well aware, and probably most people in the room, but essentially there were huge changes, not just in the way we communicated, but in cultural shifts and values and things that were very much around gender and inclusivity. And it's, a, it's a, obviously many people have written about this to, to a great extent. But the thinking was, with that came kind of, re kind of a revolution, right? So people brought new empowerment to particularly women that could now be empowered to communicate in ways that the society deemed not acceptable at the time, and on and on. How can we, we're talking about AI and how it can be more um, kind of support us and empower us, but I'm also, we also hear words as, uh, you know, as Liz Gerber put up, these kind of revolutionary terms and things around changing the way that um, we're using technology. And it almost seems like an opportunity to connect this to this revolution with other kinds of revolutions 
we, we know there's going to be new social norms that develop, new values, new kinds of ethics. We can also have a, a, an important, but maybe it's a side, but very important conversation about how do we put ourselves in line with the adoption, which we know there's going to be AI, and embed these really strong values of equity, inclusion. We can, we can sort of change society alongside of the technology adoption. I'm just curious, I don't have any answers to that, but I, I, I'm really excited about that opportunity for kind of our society and the world, but comments on that. It just looking at me, why? Because Eric Paulson and I've been having conversations for 150 years. Hello, Eric. Hello. Been a while. It's been a while, <laughs> yes. Look, Eric, one of the things that's really striking to me about going back to 19th century telegraphy is that it is a technology that does some things that haven't been possible since. I mean, the way it collapses time, so it goes in the instance of Australia from taking 46 days on the fastest ship with the wind behind you to get a message from London to Adelaide to four and a half hours and 36 pairs of hands, right? And that's a shift in time, that, a percentage shift that we've never seen since. But it also means that it goes from communication to information because what moves has to change. And you have this kind of fundamental shift, as you rightly say, new business models get created, new forms of communication come into being, new kinds of experiences get privileged, and new kinds of people get disenfranchised in that moment. And I think, not unreasonably, sitting in the 1850s or 1860s, you might not have known those were going to be the consequences of a global technology. Sitting in 2022, looking into 2023, we're kind of out of excuses. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's pretty hard to say, oh gosh, I had no idea that this would <laughs> fundamentally reinscribe inequities along the lines of gender, class, race, religion, able-bodiedness, and location. Um, so for me, there's a little bit that sort of says, if we no don't have that as a, I mean, I don't think you can legitimately say that at this moment in time. So if you can't say that, your question then is precisely the right one, which is how do we then call into being through our work and our activities a set of pragmatics that mean you aren't reinscribing all those things we know technical systems do if you don't think about it deliberately and deliberatively. And so then it becomes a whole lot of really hard work. Everything from how do we think about who our students are to who's standing in front of them in the classrooms to how do we think about educating our regulators, how do we think about what companies and governments will be building here, and how are we intensely attentive to the fact that we have at least 170 years of history that tells us where the problems are going to be. So we should be able to, if not stop them, certainly anticipate them with slightly more rigor, which isn't really a helpful way of saying, yeah, we know what's going to happen, so how do we make sure that it doesn't happen quite as badly? OK. I think on that note, please, we're going to end right there. Thank can, you for such please, an engaging please, 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 conversation. Please, please. Oh, wait, I just want to, that's wait. a really sad note. I'm so, like, this is a bad note. I mean, it's not a bad note. I just, it's depressing. I'm depressed. So, you know, what I, what I want to say is the flip side of that is, like, let's envision the world we want to live in. That's correct. In. Not just how can we make a shitty world less shitty, um, but how can we really think about a beautiful world we want to live in and go for that? Well, like I said, I mean, I think you have to. So I, I, can, I, can, I can salvage what sounded to you like depressing, but to me it was just a clarion call of clarity, which is to say we have this responsibility, right, to tell yeah. stories about a, a future or futures, because I think it's multiple, right. that are more fair and equitable yes. and sustainable and just. Yes. But then we also have to act right now to ensure those Correct. aren't just stories but actualities. Great. Fun. I now took it as a call to action. <laughs> um, We've done that for you now. And thank you for that great conversation. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the questions. <laughs>